Today on The Secret Sits, I am going to tell you the stories of a literary forger or two, all based around the most illustrious dramatist and poet to ever live, William Shakespeare. But don't worry, we are going to have some fun telling these tales. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Literary crimes may not be the most popular of true crime stories. They sometimes lack the thrills and chills that accompany our favorite true crimes, capers, and conundrums. However, there have been a few of these literary crime stories that are captivating because they are the most audacious forgeries in human civilization. We covered Lee Israel's career as a literary forger during season one of The Secret Sits, but one also thinks of the Hitler Diaries from the 1960s or when Clifford Irving forged the papers of Howard Hughes. We listen to these stories and the boldness it took to get away with these crimes, and somehow we find ourselves admiring their veracity. So today, I'm going to present to you some of the most outrageous and captivating forgeries in human civilization. The Shakespeare forgeries of William Henry Ireland and John Payne Collier. Both of these men produced documents which they claimed had originally been penned by the bard himself, William Shakespeare. Now, just to be clear, William Henry Ireland and John Payne Collier are certainly not the only people to attempt forgeries of one of the greatest poets ever known. But they were two of the most successful at their attempts. Forgeries of Shakespeare's works date all the way back to the 1630s, and to make their attempted forgeries seem even more credible, these people would also conjure up stories about William Shakespeare's life that were simply not true. But to make their counterfeit work true, they had to convince you that the documents they possessed somehow fit into the author's true life. I personally am a big fan of Shakespeare. While in college, I took a lot of Shakespeare classes for my major in theater. During my collegiate career, I also performed in many Shakespearean plays. My favorite role was Laertes from Hamlet. In Hamlet, Laertes is the son of Polonius and the brother of Ophelia. In the final scene, he mortally stabs Hamlet with a poison-tipped sword to avenge the deaths of his father and sister, for which he blamed Hamlet. The Laertes character is thought to have been originated by Shakespeare himself. As I sit writing this episode, I am cruising aboard the beautifully appointed MSC Davina cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. I'm sitting on my private balcony on the 12th floor. The water is the deepest ocean blue, and pure white caps form as the ship glides through the water. The only sounds are the gentle splashing sounds of the waves as they slip away from the sides of the ship. And a woman, who sounds like she smokes three packs a day, talking on a balcony a few cabins down. But either way, as I am sitting here writing you this episode, I can somehow imagine myself aboard a wooden-clad ship, sailing through the waters in the time of William Shakespeare. So first, let's talk a little about William Shakespeare, 
don't worry, this will not be like English lit class in high school. I taught intro to Shakespeare in a community college. Now, here is the briefest summation of whom William Shakespeare was that you will ever hear. Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616. He died at the ripe old age of 52. He was an English playwright, poet, and actor. He is generally regarded as the greatest writer in the English language, and he is also considered the world's greatest dramatist in any language. Shakespeare is often referred to as England's national poet. He is the Bard of Avon, or simply the Bard. But what is a bard, you ask? Well, a bard is simply someone who is a masterful poet. So bard is, in essence, a synonym for poet. Shakespeare's total works include 38 plays, 154 sonnets, and three narrative poems. Shakespeare's plays have been translated into every single language still used by humans today and he is the most performed dramatist in the entire world. All of Shakespeare's works are in public domain, so theaters can do whatever they would like to with his work, no holds barred. Shakespeare married a woman named Anne Hathaway. We will talk more about this later. And now that we are on the same page about the dramatist we are talking about, let's now speak on the men who would attempt their fate at profiting off of this literary juggernaut. The first of these men was William Henry Ireland. He had the same first name as Shakespeare, not that that helped. William Henry Ireland was somewhat of an inconsequential adolescent. He constantly attempted to please his father, who was a man with a well-built reputation around town. We are now in the year 1795. Everything smells a little like dirt and despair, and maybe a little rose water if you're lucky. Young Mr. Ireland is now 19 years old, and still just as worthless as he had been his entire childhood. In the early spring, Samuel Ireland, who was William's father, and a collector and antiquities dealer, took his son on a trip to visit Stratford-upon-Avon, which we know was William Shakespeare's hometown. Samuel Ireland is dressed in the typical fashion of the late 18th century, including his man wig, which everyone was wearing. William wore his hair long. The style invoked the romantic poets of the time. William was slim and clearly subservient to his father. He was a shy young lad who was nothing to write home about in the looks department, if you get my drift. He was easily overlooked by anyone on the street. The middle-aged man and his son were being guided through the small hamlet by John Jordan, a local town historian who was considered an expert on all things Shakespearean in Stratford. During their scenic tour of Shakespeare's birthplace, they visited the site of the bard's birth and the location of Shakespeare's opulent house. He had built this house with a career's worth of earnings, working as England's most celebrated dramatist. The house, named New Place, had been deconstructed over 35 years ago. All that remained of a storied man's history was a stone wall and remnants of a beautiful garden. After visiting these historical treasures, they proceeded to the shop of one Mr. Sharp. Now, Mr. Sharp's deal was that he carved knickknacks out of the mulberry wood cut from a tree that once took up residence in the garden of one Mr. Shakespeare. In fact, to make the wood even more valuable, Shakespeare supposedly even planted the mulberry tree himself. He just got right in there down in the dirt and buried some trees with the same hands that wrote Twelfth Night. So now, the wood triples in price. Samuel Ireland picked up one of the cups, first grown from the hands of Shakespeare himself, and then carved by the hands of Mr. Sharp, a fitting name for a whittler, hey? And he spun the wooden cup around in his hands, as if it were the chalice from Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. Samuel purchased the cup and took precious care with his new treasure. After getting their jollies at Mr. Sharp's, the group headed to their final destination, 
a small farm cottage belonging to lifelong Stratford-upon-Avon residents, Mr. and Mrs. Williams. Mr. Williams had come to possess quite a few artifacts from the new place home when it still stood 40 years ago. This probably gave Samuel Ireland more than goosebumps. Mr. Williams introduced himself to the man and his tragic-looking son, and he told them, Just last week, I got rid of a great quantity of old papers. They were in the attic, and I wanted the space to raise some young partridges. So I burned the papers right there in this fireplace, didn't I, Mistress Williams? That you did, Master Williams, his wife dutifully replied. And a great many of them had Shakespeare's name on them, didn't they, Mistress? The man croaked. That they did, Master Williams, said the old woman. At this, Samuel Ireland, as dramatic as ever, crumpled into the nearest chair. Good God, man, if I had only been here a week ago, this is disastrous. And just so you know, this is not turned into a play, but you have to hear the context of this conversation. So just hold on, we're getting there. In response to Samuel's dramatics, Mr. Williams said, Well, couldn't be helped, needed the space, don't you know? Samuel Ireland lifted his head, like Hugh Grant in a rom-com, and said, Could you show me the garret? Garret means attic for all our American listeners. If you like, stated the old man, and Samuel Ireland, with his hideous young son in tow, followed the old farmer up the ladder to the attic. As Samuel peered into the area which used to contain a literary giant's writings, now contained a dozen partridges scurrying around pecking at the floor for food. After this disappointing end to their tour, Samuel left Stratford with his dreadful son. I would give half my precious library for a single example of the great bard's writings. What a tragedy has occurred, Samuel said to his obnoxious son. After Samuel and William Henry had left the small farm cottage, old Mr. and Mrs. Williams, along with tour guide John Jordan, all began to cackle, almost doubled over with laughter. And Mr. Williams said, Never ceases to amaze me, John, how these lovers of Shakespeare swallow whole the burnt paper's story. Watch out for the frauds, people. They are everywhere. A few weeks after this trip, the revolting William Henry came home to his father, whom he could never please, and said he had obtained something rather special for him. He then produced a receipt, written out and signed by William Shakespeare himself. The receipt was for the repayment of a loan. Samuel almost let go all over his living room, and he grabbed the paper. The paper was very old. The ink had faded from black to brown over the passing of time. What would you expect from a document 200 years old? Samuel asked his horrid son, Where on earth did you obtain this, my lad? I chanced to meet a young gentleman who told me he had a cache of documents from the Elizabethan era, and he invited me to pursue them, William told his father. Samuel asked, And who is this young gentleman? What is his name? But the foul boy responded with, Ah, father, that I cannot tell you. He wished to remain anonymous. Okay, red flag number one. But Samuel tried to work around how random this was. He wanted so badly to possess something, anything, that had been once scribed by the one and only William Shakespeare. So he asked his repulsive son, And how came it that they gave you this precious document? William Henry said, He has taken a liking to me. He bade me to accept it as a gift. And father, I saw other papers in his trunk. A cursory inspection tells me that there are more papers with the name of Shakespeare upon them. Samuel was now in the throes of giddiness. And he told his son, By all means, you must examine them. I must see them. Can you describe them? William told his father that he could not describe the papers, 
but he would return to the young gentleman's home in a day or two. Samuel Ireland, who did not trust his hopeless son any further than he could throw him, had to verify the document that William had presented to him. He conferred with fellow antiquarians, that means people who study antiques, who agreed with him that he definitely had in his possession a very old piece of paper. But wait, that's not all. They also said that the writing and signature resembled some few known examples of Shakespeare's signatures. Okay, back to teacher mode. There are only six surviving and authenticated signatures written by William Shakespeare himself. All six of these signatures are contained in four legal documents. First, a deposition in the Bellot v. Mount Joy case, which is dated May 11, 1612. Secondly, paperwork for the purchase of a property in Blackfriars, London, dated March 10, 1613. And third is a signature on the mortgage of this same property, dated March 11, 1613. And finally, Shakespeare's last will and testament. This document contains three of the six signatures, one for each page. And this document is dated March 25, 1616. The interesting thing about all six of these signatures is that William Shakespeare himself spelled his name differently on each document, and none of the signatures are how Shakespeare's name is spelled today. Okay, now back to our story. Each week after this, the unaccomplished youth brought home a new document ascribed to William Shakespeare. The first few documents were simple, everyday items, like the receipt, followed by more unremarkable legal papers of varying degrees of interest. But then, after buttering up the old man with boring and assertedly authentic Shakespearean documents, William brought a gift to his father that made the man's toes curl. What was this item, you ask? An authentic love letter from William Shakespeare to his wife, Anne Hathaway. No, not Anne Hathaway from the movie musical Les Mis. For our American listeners, remember that Shakespeare recap at the beginning of the episode. Just like the other boring documents William Henry had produced, this one too had old paper and brown and faded ink. As an added gift with purchase, this letter also came with a locket of hair from the most famous poet in the world, William Shakespeare. If the man had not been so out of sorts at the sheer magnitude of this letter, he may have noticed that the scribe of this letter neglected to use any punctuation in the entire letter, and that some of the pages contained small singes on the side, making the paper brown. Perhaps if the antiquarian had paid more attention to the details of the letter, he would have reconsidered the paper's authenticity. By this point, Samuel's house looked like the room of an obsessed teenage girl who has built a shrine to their teenage crush, like the creepy guy in The Bodyguard who is obsessed with Whitney Houston. But Samuel's shrine was to Shakespeare. Literary experts and celebrants flocked to the house to see the newly found documents. It was so unexpected that Samuel's dolt of a son would discover such a treasure trove of historical documents. At this point, Samuel began to re-examine his perception of his dullard of a son. Maybe he wasn't rubbish. With each new document, excitement grew. And then William Henry came to his father and told him that he had the most exciting news. The young gentleman, who could not be named, had in his possession a full-length painting of Shakespeare and that the young gentleman, whom we could refer to as George Glass, would soon give William Henry the painting. He would then pass this very authentic painting on to his father Samuel. The young gentleman, our George Glass, is now being referred to as Mr. H. The reclusive Mr. H, whose name sounds like a bad Bond villain, still wanted to remain anonymous, 
So William Henry told his father that he would continue to hide the man's true identity. By this point, Samuel Ireland was acting like Emperor Palpatine, and his want for more and more Shakespeareana became ferocious. Samuel asked his son about the portrait, and he asked for more and more content from the great poet. William Henry then gave his insatiable father a will, dated 1611. At this point, I was going to explain the political dynamics during the 1600s around wills according to different religious groups, but I bored myself just trying to write something. Anyway, to Samuel Ireland, this clearly showed that William Shakes had been a good, true, God-fearing Protestant and not a closeted Catholic, as many in the public had decreed after his death. This confirmed the moral nature of Samuel's literary idol, and the array of visitors to Samuel Ireland's home in London continued to increase. One notable patron of the London house was James Boswell, a renowned biographer of the scholar Samuel Johnson. Boswell viewed the papers and examined them with a scholarly eye. He then knelt in reverence, and in that moment declared that he could now die a happy man. Boswell then signed, in testament, along with many others, to the authenticity of these miraculous discoveries. James Boswell then went to his eternal rest, the happiest scholarly man, because he had witnessed these new Shakespeare artifacts just before his death. This was still not the end to this treasure trove of never-before-discovered papers. Oh no, why stop now? This is like Mary Poppins' bag. Stuff just keeps coming out when you need it. Next, William Henry produced a handwritten manuscript in Shakespeare's own pen of King Lear, one of the greatest dramatic works in history. Samuel read through the script and noticed that many of the looter scenes from the play had not been in this, the original manuscript. Samuel knew that his man-crush Willie Shakes had not written such crude scenes, and they must have been added later by the actors and stage managers. For those that worshipped Shakespeare, like Samuel Ireland, Shakespeare was of very high morals and he was exceptionally pure of heart. Even with this new discovery, Samuel pressed his remarkable son to produce the full-length portrait. He needed to be able to look Shaky W in the eye while holding his original papers. In response to this request, William Henry gave his father another manuscript. But this manuscript was not one of the 38 plays attributed to the bard. It was titled Vortigern, and William Henry told his father that it was not the end. There were other unknown manuscripts of a play titled Henry VII. There seemed to be no end to the discoveries. As so many new findings were taking place, several authorities began to question some of the paper's authenticity. The great Edmund Malone was the foremost Shakespeare scholar of the day, and he had his doubts. Even as questions were raised, Samuel Ireland pressed on and moved forward with his passion over these Shakespeare papers. He maintained that they were all papers touched by the bard himself. Samuel was so convinced that all of his artifacts were real that he persuaded John Kemble to mount a production of Vortigern at the Covent Garden Theatre, not a shabby place by any means. Samuel thought, now the public will see the genius of Shakespeare on stage once again and be humbled by his greatness. As rehearsals came to an end and the troupe was set to perform the premiere performance of Vortigern, Edmund Malone published a carefully scripted paper in rejection of the authenticity of the Ireland papers. Malone wrote that they were simple forgeries. Dates and people were incorrect in some of the legal documents, Malone stated. 
Some of the language used in the papers simply did not exist in Shakespeare's time, along with some of the odd spellings that had appeared in some of the documents. One letter, ostensibly sent from Queen Elizabeth, not our Queen Elizabeth who just passed, she's not that old, this was Queen Elizabeth I. Anyways, the letter contained misspellings and language that no queen would use to one who was not of noble birth. Also, in Malone's diatribe on how the papers were not authentic, he described how some of the letters sent to Shakespeare were not in the penmanship of their supposed authors. This was a devastating critique of the newly found Shakespearean collection. Despite the brutal review from Malone, the performance of Vertigern was performed anyway. The audience sat in anticipation how exciting it was to be the first audience to see an unproduced Shakespearean play. Kemble, along with his troupe of actors, delivered stellar performances for what the material provided. But as the play began, the audience could instantly tell that this was scripted by an utterly amateur dramatist. The play's language was nonsensical, and the story was abysmal at best. Laughter rang up from the audience as they recognized that in no way was this some lost Shakespearean play. It was simply utter rubbish. After the Malone Review and the rotten performance of Vertigern, Samuel Ireland had nothing left to do but dig his heels into the sand and stand his ground. Samuel was just going to keep on keeping on. Remember, Samuel had held quite a high reputation around town, even before the newly found Shakespeare papers. So, in response to the town's criticism, Samuel wrote a letter in his defense, and in this letter, he stood by all of his new Shakespearean papers. He said that he had obtained them through his son, William Henry, by way of Mr. H. Samuel went on to attack the actors in the play, particularly Kemble. He said they had ruined the production with their overacting. Despite this letter in Samuel's defense, the people of the town now saw Samuel Ireland as either a charlatan or a fool. From the initial day when William Henry brought home that receipt in Shakespeare's handwriting, until the production of the play at Covent Garden, was only a few months. In these few months, the Beatlemania-like craze for these newly discovered Shakespearean papers was like the lift chain hill on a roller coaster. And after the performance of Vertigern, that coaster topped the hill and the enthusiasm for the new Shakespeare papers plummeted in a dramatic fashion. Only a few of Samuel's dearest friends continued to give the man a wink and a nudge that the papers were authentic. The downward hill of this roller coaster ride turned into a train wreck that people could not look away from. Perhaps in order to get to the next uphill on the roller coaster ride, William Henry began to produce even more documents, which went from the unusual to the bizarre. One letter, written by old Willie Shakes himself, described how he had been saved from drowning by a young man named William Henry Ireland. How convenient that the man who saved Shakespeare from drowning had the exact same name as our William Henry all these decades later. But wait, there's more. This letter was sent to a Mr. John Hemming. Could this be a reference to our bad Bond villain, Mr. H? Let's see. In this letter, Shakespeare says to Mr. Hemming that his savior would be the future recipients of his play manuscripts. So it turns out that our William Henry Ireland was the legal heir to the Shakespearean documents after all. Wow, it's amazing. Even the most gullible people in the town thought this story was as difficult to get down as Aunt Thelma's dry Sunday roast. The only person to believe this cock and bull story was, well, you guessed it, Samuel Ireland, who would believe 
anything just to be certain that his precious collection was real. As time had passed, the imprudent William Henry had told some people that he had forged the Shakespeare papers. William Henry was working as a scrivener for a lawyer. That's a person who makes hand copies before Xerox was invented. At the law office, he had access to old writing paper dating back to the late 16th century. William Henry had procured the ink from a book restoration specialist. After William Henry ran out of the paper from his office, he bought paper from a book dealer who would allow him to cut blank pages from 16th century books. He would hold the pages up to a flame to help further age them. This produced the scorch edges, which were sometimes present on the new Shakespeare papers. William Henry went to his father and confessed to making the forgeries. But Samuel still did not want to believe that it was true. He knew that his son was too dim-witted, unimaginative, and slow to have pulled off such a scam. Whomever had written these papers had to have been brilliant, and have we mentioned that William Henry was adult? Samuel held his belief that only one as great as Shakespeare could have produced these works. William Henry had found one thing he was good at in life, forging documents that had supposedly come from notable figures. But he did not do this simply for self-gratification or to gain riches. No, William Henry set out on this new career as a master fake, only to gain the affection and acceptance from his fastidious father. William Henry thought his father should praise him for his abilities to mimic someone as esteemed as the mighty Shakespeare. But Samuel would hear none of this. If he believed what his son said, that meant his precious papers were not real. And that was more important to him than his son's truth. Samuel Ireland would die just five years after this entire debacle. In the end, he held on to his belief that his beloved Shakespearean papers were true and real. But he had lost his once stellar reputation, and he was completely shunned by the antiquarian and literary communities. They now believed that Samuel himself may have been the actual forger. William Henry lived on after his father's passing, and he wrote many different novels, dramatic works, and articles. William believed that because he had passed off so many documents as those of the famous bard himself, then that must mean he was, in effect, a second Shakespeare. In 1821, William Henry published Confessions, in which he detailed his massive forgery scheme, giving all of the juicy details like a good true crime novel. William Henry never did produce the full-length portrait of William Shakespeare he had been dangling in front of his father like a carrot on a stick. I guess William was not as good at painting as he was at writing really bad literary work. Now that we have unraveled the fraudulent efforts of Mr. William Henry, we are now going to all get into the hot tub time machine and move forward 20 years after William Henry published his confession. And we're going to talk about our second Shakespeare forger, John Payne Collier. But that is coming your way next week on The Secret Sits. We dance round in a ring and suppose. But the secret sits in the middle and knows. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Leigh.